Welcome to Furniture Industry News, the go-to podcast for the latest updates and insights for professionals in the furniture industry. Whether you're a retailer, manufacturer, or just someone passionate about furniture, you're in the right place to stay informed on the latest trends and major developments shaping our industry. I'm your host, and we've got a packed episode today. We'll be covering significant news like the merger updates between Kroger and Albertsons, potential store closures from Big Lots, and the ongoing legal battle between the FTC and Temper Sealy over the mattress firm acquisition. We'll also dive into Cozy's innovative pop-up store strategy in Vancouver, the newly proposed OSHA heat safety rule that could impact furniture manufacturers, and some eye-opening statistics about furniture damage across American households. So grab your notebooks, get comfortable, and let's dive right in. And Kroger and Albertsons are moving ahead with a significant $24.6 billion merger aimed at consolidating two of the largest grocery giants in the United States. To secure the approval of the Federal Trade Commission, the two companies have proposed selling off 579 stores across 18 states and Washington, D.C. This move is intended to address antitrust concerns by divesting locations to Cannes Wholesale Grocers, a wholesaler known for owning supermarket chains like Grand Union and Piggly Wiggly. Interestingly, Fred Meyer Superstores, which are also owned by Kroger, are not included in the list of stores to be sold. Fred Meyer is a hybrid concept that combines grocery items with general merchandise, which notably includes a furniture department. These superstores operate predominantly in the Pacific Northwest, with a footprint of 132 locations spread across Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. For those in the furniture industry, the key takeaway here is the potential ripple effect this merger might cause. While Fred Meyer stores are spared from the list of divestitures, the merger's approval hinges on the understanding that these comprehensive retail hubs could continue to thrive and maintain consumer loyalty. The furniture sections within Fred Meyer stores could see a shift in market dynamics as competition changes. The divestiture means hundreds of existing stores will be shifted to Cannes Wholesale Grocers, potentially affecting local furniture sales in those regions. Should the merger go through, the change in ownership and management practices could alter everything from supply chain efficiencies to customer service approaches, impacting how furniture products are marketed and sold. Moreover, it's essential to consider the possible benefits and challenges this merger may bring to the furniture sections of these stores. On one hand, the streamlining of operations and potential for expanded resources might enhance product offerings and improve inventory management. On the other hand, there could be temporary disruptions as the new management takes over and integrates these numerous stores into their broader operations. So while the overarching narrative of this merger revolves around grocery dominance, its implications for the furniture segments within these stores cannot be overlooked. For professionals in the furniture industry, especially those dealing with large-scale retail partners, keeping an eye on this merger's progression and understanding its broader impacts could be crucial for strategic planning and market adaptation. Stay tuned as we continue to follow this merger closely, providing insights into how it will unfold and what it means for the landscape of retail and furniture sales. Big Lots, a prominent name in retail and part of the top 100 list, has recently announced some concerning news. They might be closing between 35 to 40 stores in 2024. This decision comes in response to several economic pressures that are affecting their sales, particularly in the furniture category. Outlined in a detailed 240-page filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission, Big Lots expressed serious concerns about their ability to continue as they are. The Columbus, Ohio-based company, which operates nearly 1,400 stores across 48 states, noted that their core customer base is feeling the pinch of inflation and price increases. This, in turn, has led to a noticeable dip in sales of higher-priced items, such as furniture. In the first quarter of 2024, Big Lots saw a decrease in comparable store sales and net sales across all categories, including furniture, seasonal items, and home products. The economic pressures on customers' discretionary spending have made them more cautious about splashing out on big-ticket items. However, it's not all doom and gloom for Big Lots. The company has shown signs that it's on the path to recovery. For instance, 
They reduced their operating loss from 23.2% in the first quarter of 2023 to 19.1% in the first quarter of 2024. They also managed to shrink their inventory by 12.7% year over year, bringing it down to $949.9 million. These changes indicate that, with some time and strategic adjustments, big lots might reverse some of the negative trends they're currently facing. It's crucial to understand the broader implications for the furniture industry. Big lots store closures could potentially free up market share, giving competitors an opportunity to swoop in. However, it might also indicate a broader issue, consumers' growing reluctance to spend on bigger, more expensive home items. Big Lots is adapting by bolstering liquidity and chasing what they call extreme bargain deals, which could attract price-conscious shoppers. They're also looking to streamline operations and focus on areas they consider most profitable. In conclusion, while Big Lots faces significant challenges, their strategic efforts aimed at recovery could stabilize their position. For those in the furniture industry, it's a mixed bag. There could be new opportunities arising from Big Lot's tightening footprint, but the overall market sentiment towards high-ticket items like furniture remains cautious. Stay tuned as we continue to monitor these developments and provide insights on how they unfold in the months to come. The Federal Trade Commission has taken a bold stand, suing to block Temper Sealy International's proposed $4 billion acquisition of Mattress Firm. The FTC argues that this merger would reduce competition in the mattress industry, which could ultimately lead to higher prices for consumers. This legal battle is a significant event, garnering extensive attention not just within the industry, but also amongst consumers and regulators. Temper Sealy, a dominant player in the mattress market, has countered these claims vigorously. They argue that the FTC has ignored the competitive dynamics of the rapidly growing e-commerce mattress sector. Temper Sealy believes that the acquisition will not harm competition, but rather bolster their ability to innovate and offer better products and services to customers. The FTC, however, remains firm in its stance. Their unanimous 5-0 vote to oppose the deal indicates the agency's confidence in their assessment that the acquisition poses antitrust risks. The FTC's complaint highlights Temper Sealy's alleged intent to dominate the market, potentially stifling competition and harming rival mattress manufacturers. On the other side, both Temper Sealy and Mattress Firm have expressed their disappointment with the FTC's decision. Temper Sealy's leadership has stated that they are well prepared to defend their case in court, emphasizing that they have complied with regulatory requirements throughout the acquisition process. Mattress Firm, with over 2,300 stores making it the largest specialty sleep retailer, echoes Temper Sealy's confidence in the benefits of the merger. This showdown has significant implications for the betting industry. If the FTC succeeds in blocking the merger, it could maintain the current competitive landscape, potentially benefiting smaller mattress manufacturers and maintaining price competition. On the flip side, if Temper Sealy prevails, the industry might see a substantial shift, consolidating more power with one of its largest players. For now, the legal proceedings continue without a set court date. Both parties prepare for what promises to be a contentious and closely watched trial. The outcome could shape the future of the mattress market, influencing everything from pricing strategies to the landscape of retail and e-commerce sales. Cozy, the direct-to-consumer furniture brand, has taken an exciting step by launching a new pop-up store on Granville Street in Vancouver. This store will be open through the end of September and showcases Cozy's modular sofas and chairs, along with a variety of home accents, ranging from living room tables and storage solutions to decorative pillows and rugs. By setting up this pop-up, Cozy aims to combine the convenience of online shopping with the tangible benefits of an in-store experience. Customers can now test out the furniture firsthand and see fabric samples in person before making a purchase. This initiative is a continuation of Cozy's strategy, following their flagship store opening in Toronto last March, which marked their shift from an exclusively online model to one that includes physical retail locations. The Vancouver pop-up comes on the heels of a successful three-month stint in Montreal and serves as a way for Cozy to gather insights and gauge interest in various Canadian cities. This data will help them make informed decisions about future store locations, potentially expanding their physical presence further. 
By offering both an online and in-person shopping experience, Cozy is likely to enhance customer engagement and boost sales. For a brand originally rooted in e-commerce, this hybrid approach can attract a broader audience and provide valuable customer feedback that might not be as easily obtainable through online channels alone. With the pop-up store, Cozy is well-positioned to strengthen its brand in the competitive furniture market and deliver a more comprehensive shopping experience to its customers in Vancouver and beyond. OSHA is putting forward a new heat safety rule aimed at safeguarding workers, and this is especially relevant for those in the furniture manufacturing industry. If enacted, the rule would mark the first federal standard requiring employers to create and implement plans to manage and mitigate heat-related hazards in the workplace. The proposed rule is designed to protect both indoor and outdoor workers. For furniture manufacturers, this means ensuring that factory floors, assembly lines, and storage areas do not become dangerous due to excessive heat. According to OSHA, the threshold for what they consider excessive heat begins at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Once this temperature is reached, employers would need to take several steps to protect their employees. They'd be required to provide cool drinking water, offer break areas with cooling measures, and implement controls to manage the indoor climate. New and returning employees must follow acclimatization protocols to help their bodies adjust to working in the heat. If the heat hits 90 degrees, mandatory rest breaks of at least 15 minutes every two hours would kick in to ensure workers get a chance to cool down. Employers would also have to train staff on recognizing the signs of heat-related illnesses and establishing clear communication channels for these types of emergencies. In essence, the rule aims to make it easier for workers to stay healthy and productive, even during high temperature conditions. For furniture manufacturers, this regulation would not only improve worker well-being, but could also lead to fewer heat-related accidents and illnesses, ultimately enhancing overall productivity. Public comments are being accepted for 120 days following the official publication of the rule, so there's still time for industry stakeholders to weigh in. This new rule underscores a significant shift in how workplace safety is approached, particularly for industries like furniture manufacturing, where conditions can often be hot and strenuous. By taking proactive steps, employers can ensure their work environments are safe, thereby reducing downtime and boosting employee morale. A recent survey reveals some eye-opening statistics about furniture damage in American homes. Over 174 million Americans have experienced furniture damage, with the odds of an accident happening within the first two years of ownership at 61%. The most commonly damaged items? It's no surprise. Sofas and love seats top the list at 40%, closely followed by rugs at 12%, then recliners and chairs at 8%. Beds, Headboards, kitchen tables, and entertainment centers also make the list, but at lower percentages. Careless spills and stains are the main culprits, contributing to over half of the damage incidents. Juice stains come out on top, responsible for 25% of all spills, while pets account for 21% of the furniture stains, followed by coffee at 20%, sauces and condiments at 15%, and red wine at 12%. Beyond spills, rips and tears are common, taking up 25% of the incidents with dents, scratches, chips, and cracks also appearing on the damage radar. Interestingly, despite the reputation that kids and pets often get, it's actually spouses who are blamed most frequently for causing the damage, at a surprising 45%. Children come next at 34%, with dogs contributing to 20% of the damage, and cats at 11%. As for preventive measures, furniture owners are getting creative. About 38% of people are covering their furniture with sheets or towels, 29% are using slip covers, and a significant 20% are treating furniture to prevent stains. Additionally, around 22% of respondents said they've invested in protection plans or extended warranties, which many find quite useful in mitigating the stress and costs associated with damage repair. These findings offer valuable insights for furniture manufacturers and retailers in terms of product design, after-sales service, and customer education. By understanding and addressing these common issues, the industry can better cater to the needs of its customers and potentially reduce the frequency and severity of furniture damage. Thank you for tuning in to Furniture Industry News. We hope today's episode provided you with valuable insights 
and the latest updates in the furniture industry. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any future episodes. By subscribing, you'll stay informed and stay ahead in the ever-evolving furniture business. Catch you next time.